We have, as you know, uh, the honor of uh, having Secretary of Education Arne Duncan join us today. And I think he is a man who, to this group in particular, literally needs no introduction. Uh, but he's not going to get away without any introduction uh, at all. And I really do just want to say a very few brief words uh, about him. You all know what he's done as Secretary of Education. You've all been uh, 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 able to participate in that and benefit from that and, and drive reforms in your state from that. And you know that he was the CEO of Chicago Public Schools for seven years before he became secretary and was involved in other ways in education in Chicago prior to that. So I don't want to go through a lot of detail, but I have had the honor of getting to know Arnie a bit some time ago. When he first became uh, CEO in the uh, uh, Chicago Public Schools, I worked at the Aspen Institute, uh, and he quickly became a member of the Aspen Institute's Urban Superintendents Network, and it was fascinating to watch him in that role. He came to our first meeting uh, only months after he had become, not weeks, I think, after he had taken over, and what was impressive was to watch him with a group of senior superintendents. One of them, by the way, is here someplace. Roy Romber was uh, uh, superintendent in uh, Los Angeles at the time. He sat around a table about the size of the one, of ones that you're sitting around and had some very intense discussions about how you lead urban education in this country. And I watched him listen to people who were far more experienced than he was and listen really intensely. The next time he came back, he still listened very, very intensively, but he had more to say. And what he talked about were the things that he was already starting to do in Chicago to drive dramatic reform there. And by the time he came back the next time, right, he was leading the discussion because he had displayed such a sense of urgency, such a sense of passion, and such a sense of commitment to bringing change to the Chicago public schools that others were taking notes every time he talked. Arnie has brought that same kind of listening and leadership uh, as U.S. Secretary of Education. When he first came into office, he listened an awful lot to a lot of people. And as he did that, he formulated a reform agenda that you all are familiar with that I'm not going to go through in detail. But that agenda came out of the discussions he had, came out of discussions that put on the table the toughest, toughest issues that we all have to deal with in public education. They weren't hidden anymore. They're right there on the table now. And he's pushed all of us to keep addressing those without fear, without concern, without compromise, but without stopping to listen to everyone else and take in new information and think about how to keep things moving forward. And he managed to do that at the same time that he also put together $100 billion for the education system, which is no small feat. And it has helped everybody in every state move this agenda forward in one way or another. And then finally, what I would say is he's been very, very effective at defining for all of us the urgent needs in education as economic development and workforce development needs in a very practical sense, as moral issues that we have to address for all the children in this country, and as the next set of civil rights issues that we have to address to be a more perfect union. That is a remarkable kind of leadership that we are all benefiting from. And therefore, it really is my honor and my privilege to introduce to you Arnie Duncan, the U.S. Secretary of Education. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a big day. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, congratulations first, I think, just about everybody in this room. Uh, phenomenal work. Uh, Mike, thanks for that kind, kind introduction. Those were amazing uh, learning experiences for me, and you and Bob Schwartz and the team, I owe you so much. And uh, where, where's Roy? You said Roy was here. Roy was somewhere. Right in the back. I got a, Roy's one of my heroes there. In his spare time after being governor, he decided to take on the LA school system. <laughs> <laughs> He's either brilliant or crazy. We're trying to figure that one out. But. He did an amazing job. I, I continue to learn so much from him. But um, again, just a, a really honored to be here. And I think today um, is a day many of us have looked forward to for a long, long time. Um, today marks the day 
the beginning of the development of a new and much improved generation of assessments for America's school children. Today marks the start of Assessments 2.0, and today marks one more milestone, testifying to the transformational change now taking hold in our nation's schools under the courageous leadership and vision, not by us here in Washington, but at the state and the local level. Earlier this morning, as all of you know, we announced the winners for the Race to the Top Assessment Competition. And I'm so pleased to report that 44 states and D.C. Um, that applied are all part of at least one winning grant. And the, together, these two large consortia have won awards totaling almost $330 million. It's a massive investment. As you know, the Partnership for Assessment of, of Readiness in college, for College and Careers, we've got to work on these acronyms, or PARC. <laughs> is managed by Achieve, so Mike, you got to work on that one. Great proposal, <laughs> long afternoon. <laughs> the Park Consortium did an extraordinary job. They had 26 member states. Its proposal underwent a rigorous, rigorous review by a panel of peer review experts, and it came out a winner. And that consortium is slated to receive $170 million. The, the smarter, now the hard work begins. <laughs> the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium with 31 member states won a $160 million award. And congratulations to all of you on the extraordinary hard work, commitment, and leadership. By the, <laughs> by the 2014 15 school year, the assessments developed by these two winning state consortia will be in use in any state that chooses to use them. These are not pilot projects. These are not discrete tests cobbled together. The winning consortia will be designing and implementing comprehensive assessment systems in math and English language arts. More than 35 million students are in public schools in states participating in these two groups. And states not participating are absolutely free to join in the use of these assessments. This new generation of math and English language arts assessments will cover all students in grades three through eight and at least once in high school. In addition, the Park Consortium will add optional performance tasks to inform teachers about the development of literacy and mathematics knowledge and skills in kindergarten through the second grade, really starting to get that, that early learning piece. All English language learners and students with disabilities will take these new assessments, with the exception of the 1% of students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. Unlike existing set, uh, assessments, with, which often retrofit mediocre accommodations into tests, the new assessment systems will be designed from the start to accurately assess both English learners and students with disabilities and provide appropriate accommodations. And for the 1% of students with the most significant disabilities, states will have funds to develop an alternative, alternate assessment as a result of a soon-to-be-completed competition. I'm absolutely convinced that this next generation, this new generation of state assessments will be an absolute game changer in public education. And all of you, I think, know the implications and what's at stake here. For the first time, millions of school children, parents, and teachers will actually know if students are on track for college and, career, college and careers, and if they're ready to enter college without the need for remedial instruction. Yet that fundamental shift Reorientating K-12 education to extend beyond high school graduation to college and career readiness will not be the only first here. For the first time, many teachers will have state, state assessments they have longed for, tests of critical thinking skills and complex student learning that are not just fill in the bubble tests of basic skills, but support great teaching, great instruction in the classroom. For the first time, assessments will help set a consistent high bar for success nationwide instead of misleading students, parents, and school leaders into thinking students are ready for college when in fact they're not even close. We have to stop lying and we have to start telling the truth and you guys are going to help us get there. For the first time, Teachers will consistently have timely, high-quality, formative assessments that are instructionally useful and document student growth, rather than just relying on after-the-fact, year-end tests used for accountability purposes. For the first time, state assessments will make widespread use of smart technology. They will provide students with realistic, complex performance tasks, immediate feedback, computer adaptive testing, and incorporate accommodations 
for a range of students who might need them. And last but not least, for the first time, the new assessments will better measure the higher order thinking skills, so critical, so vital to success in the global e economy of the 21st century and the future of our country's prosperity. To be on track today for college and careers, students, students need to show they can analyze and solve complex problems, communicate clearly, synthesize information, apply knowledge, and generalize learning to other settings. To fully appreciate this sea change, one has to back up for a moment, pause, and look honestly at the current state of student assessment in our nation's schools. Over the past 19 months, I visited about 42 states to talk to teachers, parents, students, school leaders, and lawmakers about our nation's schools. Almost everywhere I went, I heard people express concern that the curriculum has narrowed as more educators taught to the test, especially in schools with large numbers of disadvantaged students. State assessments today are primarily used for accountability purposes. It is true that assessments have shined light in the last decade on achievement gaps between groups of students. But it's also no secret that existing state assessments in math and English often fail to capture the full spectrum of what students know and what they can do. Students, parents, and educators know there is more to a sound education than picking the right selection on a multiple choice test. State assessments currently tend to focus on concepts that are actually pretty easy to measure. They rely mainly on multiple choice items with fill in the bubble answers. They generally provide time sensitive data and results months later and their instructional usefulness has actually expired. Typically, students take a state assessment in March or April and get the results mailed to them after the school year lets out that summer. In short, most of the assessment done in schools today is after the fact and designed to indicate only whether students have learned. Not enough is being done to assess students' thinking as they learn, to boost and enrich learning and track student growth, which is so critically important. Schools may give lots of tests, and often too many tests, quite frankly, but the assessments aren't always testing important knowledge and skills in state standards in a comprehensive way or providing high quality information about student progress. Instead of fostering a classroom culture of continuous improvement, our current assessment system often leaves teachers and parents feeling frustrated and lacking information that could actually help them accelerate student learning. Yet existing assessments are only a piece of the current problem. An assessment system and curriculum can only be as good as the academic standards to which the assessments and the curriculum are pegged. We want teachers to teach the standards if, if those standards are rigorous, globally competitive, and consistent across states. Unfortunately, as all of you know, over the past decade, numerous states, including the one I'm from, Illinois, dummied down their academic standards and their assessments. In effect, they lied to parents and to students. They told students they were proficient and on track for college success when, in fact, they weren't even close. The common core standards developed by the states, coupled with a new generation of assessments, will help put an end to this insidious practice of establishing 50 different goalposts for educational success. I've said repeatedly, and anywhere you go in the country, a three-point is worth three points. Basketball and football, touchdowns is always worth six. Somehow in education, we've been content to have 50 different goalposts. Doesn't make any sense at all. In the years ahead, for the first time, a child in Mississippi will be measured against the same standard, the same standard of success as a child in Massachusetts. Our children deserve that, and to remain competitive, our country desperately needs that. States in each consortium have agreed to set the same achievement levels or cut scores on assessments, and we will ask the two consortia to collaborate to make the results comparable across the two groups. For the first time, it will be possible for parents and school leaders to, to assess and compare in detail how students in their state are doing compared to students in other states. And I'm convinced that that level of transparency and the honest dialogue that will follow it will drive school reform in our country to an entirely different level. It's for all these reasons that shortly after taking office, President Obama called on the nation's governors and state education chiefs to develop standards and assessments that don't simply measure whether students can fill in a bubble on a test, but whether they possess 21st century skills like problem solving and critical thinking and entrepreneurship and creativity. When the president issued that challenge in March of 2009, many so-called experts questioned whether states could actually work together to set rigorous, globally competitive standards 
or collaborate to develop assessments of 21st century skills. But resolute governors, state school chief officers, and committed stakeholders all around the country have proved the skeptics dead wrong. Your collective courage will transform education and opportunity in this country for literally decades to come. To date, 35 states and D.C. have chosen to adopt the Common Core standards in math and English, and additional states are signing on over the next couple months. We think that number will get closer to 40. This initiative has been a state-led, state-run effort from start to finish, and it's an absolute testament to the vision and tenacity of state leaders who refuse to lower the bar of success for students and to cover up educational shortcomings and achievement gaps. You know that if young people today are to be productive adults in the knowledge economy, they need standards that truly prepare all of them for college and careers. One would be hard pressed to find a single pundit or education expert who foresaw this transformation. And we've called it the quiet revolution. And it's a revolution being driven by leaders in state, in state houses, state superintendents, local lawmakers, district leaders, union heads, school boards, parents, principals, and teachers. And let me give you one example. Many educators have lamented for years the persistent disconnect between what high schools expect from their students and the skills that colleges expect for their incoming freshmen. Yet both of the state consortia that won these awards in the Race to the Top assessment competition pursued and got remarkable levels of buy-in from colleges and universities. In the 26 states in the Park Consortium, post-secondary institutions that educate 90% of students who directly matriculate to college signed on to MOUs. In these MOUs, 188 public colleges and universities and 16 private ones agreed that they would work with the consortium to define what it means to be college ready on the new high school assessments. Once students show that they are prepared for college level work, these colleges promise to place these students in college level courses without remediation. In the second winning consortium, the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium, MOU signed by institutions of higher education similarly covered three quarters, 75 percent, of the, of the college students in 30 states who directly matriculate from high school. This level of collaboration, quite frankly, stunned and thrilled our team at the Department of Ed. Now, I sometimes get asked, how would a better generation of assessments really differ in practice from existing assessments? And it's a fair question, and one I especially hear from teachers, many of whom feel at times more like they're being forced to run test prep classes and basic skills instead of educating the whole child for the 21st century. I believe the impact of this next generation of assessments in the classroom will be dramatic, and that, new, and that the new assessments will support learning and instructional practices that teachers have long, long hungered for. One of the biggest frustrations of teachers with existing assessments is that they fail to test higher order reasoning and writing skills, and thus fail to show students, fail to show what students know and can do. One shot, year-end bubble tests administered on a single day too often leads us to dumbing down curriculum and instruction throughout the course of an entire school year. By contrast, these new assessments will help drive the development of rich curriculum, instruction that is tailored to individual student needs, and multiple opportunities throughout the school year to assess student learning. The Park Consortium will test students' ability to read complex texts, complete research projects, excel at classroom speaking and listening assignments, and to work with digital media. The Smarter Consortium will test students by using computer adaptive technology that will ask students questions pitched to their skill level based on their previous answers. And a series of interim evaluations during the school year will inform students, parents, and teachers about whether that child is on track. Better assessments given earlier in the school year can better measure what matters, growth in student learning. And teachers will be empowered to differentiate instruction in the classroom, propelling the continuous cycle of improvement in student learning that teachers treasure. A first-rate assessment system provides data for teachers and parents on academic progress and performance. It must measure what students have learned, not just the skills they brought with them when they arrived in the class that year. The use of smarter technology in assessments will especially alter instruction in ways that teachers welcome. Technology enables the use of dynamic models and test questions. 
It makes it possible to assess students by asking them to design products or experiments, to manipulate parameters, run tests, and record data. With the benefits of technology, assessment questions can incorporate audio and video. Problems can be situated in real-world environments where students perform tasks uh, or include multi-stage scenarios or extended essays. By way of example, NAEP has experimented with asking eighth graders to use a hot air balloon simulation to design and conduct an experiment to determine the relationship between payload mass and balloon altitude. As the balloon rises in the flight box, the students note the changes in altitude, balloon volume, and time to final altitude. Unlike filling in the bubble on a score sheet, this complex simulation task takes an hour to complete. I want to stress that neither of the two state consortia will suddenly drop new, ambitious assessments in the laps of teachers in 2014-15 without significant preparation and training and professional development. Both consortiums recognize clearly that involving teachers in the development, the scoring, and the implementation of the new assessments are absolutely essential if the assessments are going to support better teaching and better learning. It is teachers who help ensure that test items are instructionally useful. And both consortia will help their member states provide the tools and the professional development needed to assist teachers' transitions to these new assessments. PARC, for example, will be developing curriculum frameworks and ways to share great lesson plans across their states. The Smarter Balanced Assessment Coalition will develop instructional modules and professional learning communities to support teachers in understanding and using assessment results. They will involve teachers not just in writing and reviewing test items, but in scoring assessments, especially complex performance tasks. As I said earlier, this new generation of assessments combined with the unprecedented development of common college and career ready standards is a fundamental game changer in K-12 education. But that doesn't mean that the implementation of college ready standards and assessments will bring us to educational nirvana a few short years from now. As important as better assessments are, they are not the silver bullet. Standards and assessments are only the foundation upon which states will construct high quality curriculum, professional development, and all the other pieces that will support teachers preparing to teach to these new standards and students learning at much higher levels. While these assessments will not be ready until 2014-15, this work of transitioning to the new standards should start tomorrow. In fact, as I've traveled the country recently, we're seeing this work beginning in many, many districts now. They're not waiting. And I've said repeatedly, though it sometimes goes unreported, that we should never, never evaluate teachers and school performance based on just test scores or the results of a single test on a single day as the only measure of teacher performance. Parents, schools, districts, and states should assess the performance of teachers on multiple measures. Let me say that one more time. Parents, schools, <laughs> districts, and states should assess the performance of teachers on multiple measures. I tease in part, but teachers absolutely do deserve multiple observations against clear standards by trained observers and principals when they are fairly evaluated. And school performance should never be assessed based solely on year-end test scores. Student growth, attendance rates, graduation rates, matriculation to college, college perseverance, school safety, participation and success in AP and IB classes, narrowing achievement gaps, these are just some, some of the measures that should factor into school performance. And obviously, the same must be true when looking at district and state level performance as well. For now, the new assessments implemented in the 2014-15 school year will be limited to math and English language arts. There's no disagreement that math, reading, and writing are vital core components of a good education in today's knowledge economy. But as all of us know, so too is the study of science, history, foreign languages, civics, and the arts. Both the President and I absolutely reject the notion that these subjects are ornamental offerings that can or should be cut from schools during tough budgetary times. In the information age, a well-rounded, a well-rounded curriculum, a world-class education is not a luxury, but it's a necessity. Our commitment to STEM education and a well-rounded curriculum is not just rhetoric. The administration has proposed to spend more than a billion dollars to support a well-rounded education in high-need schools, including $265 million in grants to strengthen teaching and learning in the arts, foreign languages, history, civics, and financial literacy. 
The proposal to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act would also allow states to include subjects other than math in English language arts in their accountability system because we specifically want to foster the teaching of a well-rounded curriculum. The reauthorization blueprint includes millions for research, development, and the improvement of additional high-quality assessments, which could include science, history, and foreign language. Now, I've spoken at some length today for a simple reason. I think the least appreciated element, elements of President Obama's education reform agenda are his determination to prevent a narrowing of the curriculum and to move beyond bubble tests in assessing student learning. And while this day marks an absolute landmark in the development of the next generation of assessments, we all know that significant challenges lie ahead. It's our hope that the comprehensive math and English uh, language arts assessments developed by the state consortia will lay the groundwork for future efforts by states to collaborate on high quality assessments in other core subjects, including science. Science education is critical, critical for all of our students. But until a set of common college and career ready science standards uh, is put into place, the department believes that it would be premature to fund the development of comprehensive science assessments. Similarly, the new assessments do not currently include English language proficiency assessments. States that have adopted the Common Core standards will need to adapt the standards they use to gauge English language proficiency. And it's our plan to set aside funds in the fiscal 2011 budget to support the development of such assessments. But again, much of that depends on states making progress in developing common standards for ELP students. As state consortia develop new assessments for full-scale implementation over the next four years, they will inevitably make adjustments to these ambitious and unprecedented assessments. That's to be expected, even welcomed. But I also encourage state leaders to persevere in maintaining the core integrity of the proposals and to always, always resist diluting them over time. And we know those pressures and temptations will be there. The determination and commitment to collaboration the state leaders have shown in pushing for rigorous common standards in math and English needs to be maintained in designing new assessments that measure college and career readiness. Collaboration empowers states to move rapidly and at significantly less cost to them and to the country to design new assessments than if individual states had worked alone. And our department will work closely with the consortia to support their success and convene a technical advisory committee to assist all of you in these efforts. The two consortia receiving awards today share important similarities in the design of their assessment systems, but they also differ in, the, in design, and we welcome that variety. The truth, as all of us know, is there's still so much that for all of us to learn about developing valid and reliable assessments that will truly foster better teaching and a better, a better teacher and better college and career readiness, and much that states and different consortiums will be able to learn and share from each other we think will drive the national conversation. One of the biggest challenges facing the consortia is to ensure that the new assessments are crafted in a way that allows teachers, families, and the broader community to understand and to act upon the results. Everyone needs to know exactly how their students are, are doing and how, how well their schools are serving their communities. The need is not only for better, uh, better assessment system, but for one that is also transparent, intelligible, and consumer friendly. If the new generation of assessments comes up short on those counts, everything else the consortia are trying to accomplish will be that much more difficult. We know the challenges that lie ahead, but I'd like to just take a moment and celebrate this day, this dawn of Assessments 2.0. The collaboration, the courage, and the commitment of state leaders to transformation reform has been nothing short of phenomenal. In the end, the imperative here is clear. If America is to have a public school system second to none, each state needs a first-rate assessment system to measure progress, to guide instruction, and to prepare students to fulfill their tremendous academic and social potential. Thanks in huge part to your determination, your leadership, the nation's school children took one giant step closer today to fulfilling that dream and the American promise of education as the great equalizer it must be. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thanks for having me here today.
I know I speak on behalf of the entire audience here, Arnie. First of all, thank you for the grants. <laughs> but as important, I think, for everyone in the country, thank you for the message that puts that work in, in its important context. That will be very helpful to us all. Arnie's agreed to take one or two very quick uh, questions, and I believe he will give equally quick answers. <laughs> He's got a tight schedule, but if there are one or two questions, it can't be, where's my check? <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Duncan, for being here. Um, my name is Rich Crandall. I chair education in the Arizona House of Representatives. And along with my colleagues, we are huge proponents, the loudest and strongest of the reforms you're pushing. And we recognize the, the value of today. But we've had a couple of setbacks in the last 30 days that, that we just need to know what message to take back to all the people working on our efforts. Our first was obviously our disappointment that, that no Western state with a, a preponderance of Hispanics or Native Americans you know, received anything in race to the top. And then we also had joined in the high school assessment consortium, which uh, obviously didn't, didn't win anything today. What message can I take back to, the, to the, all those groups that have been working for those, uh, those initiatives? Yeah, um, Arizona put in a phenomenal, as you know, phenomenal application for the race to the top competition. And, um, we had 19 finalists, and I would have loved to have found a way to fund every single one of those. We would have thought that was a great investment, and we simply just didn't have enough dollars to do that. And so while it's absolutely disappointing and a huge amount of hard work, um, you should have great pride in what you did. And what was heard from um, you know, superintendents and governors around the country is while they would have loved the money, um, they're gonna keep, you know, they got a roadmap now. They got a plan, and they're going to keep driving forward. And we're going to find ways as we move forward to work with every single state, and we'd love to continue to work with Arizona. Um, this is not about working with a handful of states. This is not about a pilot program. This is about a national movement. And I think you guys can be huge contributors to that. Um, the, the high school uh, piece of this one, um, that application didn't work, but one of the consortium does, is looking at the high school piece, so that work's going to continue and encourage you to jump on board there and continue to work. Um, but uh, don't take this setback as a reason to stop or lose momentum. Find a way to keep driving, and we're going to find ways to continue to partner with you to do that. Thank you. We've got one more question. Uh, Secretary Duncan, this is Jim Holloway. I'm uh, Assistant Secretary in New Mexico, and I've been working with one of your colleagues, John White, uh, in the department. But, and I would like, you know, we've been talking about rural education and the rural, the, the problems in, in rural America. And I understand that you're, you're the assessment programs and this is going to, to help bring everything together. But many of those very, very small districts have a lot of problems in doing this and being able to meet uh, the, the uh, uh, core uh, competencies. So what, what are we going to do to, for those very, very small districts and looking at uh, rural education and those particular problems? Well, there's no short or simple answer there, and I've uh, been to a number of uh, rural and, and remote communities, including an Alaskan, vision, uh, Alaskan uh, Native Alaskan uh, village that didn't have running water or electricity, and that was uh, an interesting one. <laughs> Um, so the challenges are, are real and, as you know, go far beyond education. So a couple thoughts. Um, one is we can't do this alone, and we're working very hard uh, with the FCC, with the Department of Agriculture, to think about technology and broadband access, and we we'll continue to push very hard there. I think technology can be a great equalizer. Um, I want those children in rural and remote communities to be able to take AP Physics, to be able to take AP Calculus. That's not always possible today. And uh, I've had great partners with Julius Janikowski and Secretary Bill Sack, and we'll continue to make a massive investment on the technology side. Secondly, one of the challenges uh, I've heard consistently is that the teacher turnover. And teachers come and, you know, there's no housing and don't stay. Um, one recent meeting, not, not, you know, quite there, you have a really encouraging meeting. It's just fascinating. The Department of Agriculture, they actually have lots and lots of money around housing in rural communities. And we're going to think of some ways to try and pilot with them to give some housing subsidies to teachers willing to work in these communities. Um, so none of these things have easy, simple answers. Um, we know it's difficult to attract and retain talent in those communities and thinking through how we use scarce dollars to create, put some incentives out there, thinking differently about housing, thinking differently about technology. And uh, so we're not going to be able to do this alone, but we want to learn from you, hear what we're doing that's not helpful, hear what we can do better. But I think working with a couple partners around the administration, I think together we, we can have a chance to start to change this, this uh, thing. Uh, one final piece that I've heard repeatedly, it's an easy fix that I commit to you to do, is that as you know, now under NCLB, and we want to fix so much of this, that uh, it's sort of based upon paper credentials. And you have teachers teaching four or five different subjects in these communities, and they can't begin to be certified, so they get labeled as you know, not highly qualified. And that's demoralizing, it's unfair, 
and not just for these communities but across the country, we want to move from sort of paper-based credentials to highly effective. Are those teachers making a difference in students' lives? And as we move to reauthorize, <laughs> as we move to reauthorize, hopefully soon, that's one of many things we want to fix. Thanks for having me. Great, great work. Look forward to partnering with you going forward. You are an incredible speech. You said that was superb. Come on down this way. You going to tell them what to do?